Okay, um, it's 11.06 a.m. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you that have entered since, um, thank you all for showing up. Um, I'm excited that you all have joined us for our inaugural um, virtual Zoom meeting program. This is, uh, this is really neat, this is fun to do, and this is also going to be, of course, um, a first for all of us. Um, particularly uh, me, Heather, and Kimberly, which I am happy to be uh, joined by. Uh, and well, let's go ahead and get started, y'all. Okay. So I want to welcome y'all to the first session in our six week uh, fall genealogy series in partnership with the uh, Office of Archives and Records of the Archdiocese of New Orleans in New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. Um, in these six weeks, uh, every Saturday, we'll be covering um, some genealogy, uh, uh, genealogy with, um, as done through the search of New Orleans Archdiocese and Catholic Records in New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. Um, today, we're going to start with the basics of genealogical research, both from the perspective of just genealogy in general, for those of you who don't have much experience, and then genealogy research as done through the um, Archdiocese of New Orleans. So, um, I would like to uh, give the official names. Um, the City Archives and Special Collections at New Orleans Public Library is my institution. Um, you all may have been to programs on genealogy presented by us before, um, and uh, thank you for doing so. Uh, we're happy to do this collaboration today, thanks to, of course, the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans, which will be represented in our programming by Kimberly Johnson and Katie Best, and New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, which will be represented in our programming by Heather Veneziano. Um, as I said, today we will be covering the basics of both. Um, so uh, let's do a little housekeeping. Um, so during the presentation, please make a note of any questions you have during the presentation and reserve them for when I reopen the chat function at the end. At that time, I'll have a couple more guidelines. I'll give them to you. Um, I will note that we will address the content of this presentation only. If your question pertains to a future presentation, please save it if you can. Um, we will get to as many questions as we can by 1215 today. Um, now, uh, in terms of note taking, for those of you who are note takers, don't worry if you can't get as many notes as you want from the program today, because we will be recording it and it will be made available in its entirely um, through our website, archives.nolalibrary.org. On that page, we're going to have some supplemental PDF materials for each session. We're going to have the slides for each session after it airs, and we're going to have the recording of each session on the Tuesday following. Like I said, don't worry if you can't keep up with your note taking, we will be putting it up for y'all. And just so you know what I'm talking about, um, you want to go to archives.nolalibrary.org and you want to click on the link that says identifying your Catholic ancestors fall 2020 genealogy series. Um, if and when you get there, as you'll see over to the right hand side right here, there's going to be a full series description. There's going to be a register for Zoom link for if you want to recommend this to friends in the future sessions. We can take more than 300 registrants. However, each session will only allow 300 viewers, just a note. Um, then, of course, we'll have links directly to the Office of Archives of Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans and New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries websites, respectively. Then, as you scroll down, under each session for each week, and this stuff will become available as each session airs, we'll have the session materials, which will be documents. We'll have the presentation slides, which will appear after the presentation on Monday, and the video recording, which will, pres which will be presented after this presentation airs on the following Tuesday. And then, if it's relevant to the session, we'll have additional links to other online resources. So now I would like to introduce you to our presenters. Um, first up, we have 
Kimberly Johnson. She is the Senior Processing Archivist and Records Analyst for the Office of Archdiocese, Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans, where she helps manage conservation and preservation of historic and current records. She holds a Master's of Art in History and is a Certified Archivist. If you'd like to say hello, Kimberly. Hi, everybody. Next up, um, I want to introduce Heather Veneziano. Whoops, I apologize, y'all. Um, she is the Director of Public Engagement and Development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, as well as an architectural historian and cultural heritage advisor with the Preservation for of Gambrel and Peak. She holds a Master's of Fine Art and a Master's of Preservation Studies. Do you want to say hi, Heather? Hi, everyone. Um, she's not here today. She will be here for future sessions, but Katie Vest is the research archivist for the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans. And in addition, she researches and translates genealogy requests in French, Spanish, Italian, and German. She holds a Master's of Arts in History with an emphasis in public history. And um, of course, I am Amanda Fallis. I am a librarian and archivist at the New Orleans City Archives and Special Collections at New Orleans Public Library, where I work with genealogical and municipal government records. I hold a master's of library and information science, and I am also a certified archivist. So we're gonna to begin today with my presentation, which some of you may have already experienced or others of you as veteran genealogy researchers may already kind of know some of the things I'm gonna cover here today, but we think it's important to always cover this sort of stuff before we get into any sort of genealogy presentation. Um, today in my part of the session, we're going to cover what is genealogy? Um, some advice for beginners, how to manage your research and record keeping, and also advanced tips and tricks for genealogy research. Excuse me. Okay, so what is genealogy? What is genealogy research? Why do we do it? Well, of course, genealogy research, if you aren't already aware, is basically the study of your ancestors and family tree. Um, it is something, it is the one historic project that every human being is allowed to engage in and it's a wonderful process. It's really often going to be, if you decide to follow this path, the major research project of your life. It's not easy, it's not quick, but it's well worth doing because just as you want to know about your ancestors, your descendants will want to know about you. And if you go through the effort to chronicle this stuff, people will really appreciate it in the future. Um, like I said, why do we conduct it? For all those reasons, I just mentioned it. And another reason I might posit is there are going to be future people that want to study the history of our age when it becomes history for them. Um, on a, oftentimes, as we are well aware, it's the personal accounts of the people who experienced history that we go to to write it from. Your account, while it will be a a measurable value to your descendants may also be helpful to people in the future trying to learn more about us. So um, advice for beginners, of course. First of all, gather all the information you already have and put it down on paper. This could be recipes, this could be journals, this could be videos, this could be photos. Get it all together and put it in one place. That is how you begin your research project. Of course, one of the key things that may be difficult, may be hard, but you really, really need to do is interview all the family members you can, especially the elderly family members, and record what they remember about the family, about the places, about everything. Um, because as many of you may have already experienced, once they are gone, that information sometimes goes with them. It's important to think of the best ways that you can to be able to record this information, of course, in a compassionate manner, in, in an understanding manner, but to try to get it if you can. Um, of course, um, as you all well know, and as coming to this presentation today as a part of, you should join a genealogical society or a similar group to make contacts and talk to like-minded people. It's information exchange between you and fellow researchers that's going to help you develop your craft as a genealogist. And lastly, if you haven't already, but you are here today, explore the internet. 
Um, as you know, there are databases, there are websites, there's even social media where you can connect with others going on the same search or similar searches to your own. So research and record keeping, the basics. Um, so when you're researching, begin all searches with a clear goal in mind. This is not going to be a 15 minute one day thing where you uh, leave the session, you're, you're typing in a database with a full family tree. That's not what genealogy research is. As we said, it's a lifelong research project. Um, so you're going to have to break it down into small tasks. One of the examples is today, I am going to look for my great great grandmother's birth date. So you're going to make sure you focus only on those types of records, only on those types of collections. That's going to be for your task for the day. And even if you hit a wall or can't finish, just make sure you stay focused on one thing at a time. Of course, critical, keep track of your research. Have a binder, have a, a folder or, you know, a website. Have a place to keep all the information together. Organize it. You know, you want to know who, what, where, when, and why you found a record, or you were researching a person, or you heard something. And that brings us into always cite your source. Um, if you get it from a website, include the website address, that bar at the top of your screen, also known as a URL. Um, if you go to a physical repository, make sure that you note the name of that repository and the specific collection in that repository that you got it from. For example, at the City Archives, we have lots of different collections. We have the court records, we have voter registration rules, we have um, passenger list, we have naturalizations. Each of those type of record is a different collection. So anytime you go anywhere, whether it's virtually or in person, Note the repository that's responsible for it and the collection you got it from. And of course, this is of more interest to you, the date you found it. It might help you to know the date that you found something because if you ever have to go back and figure out where you were, that date may be the jumping off point for you to remember what you were doing and where you were at that time period. Of course, these are the other basics be open to alternate spellings, dates, and other information. Records have changes and errors that you can anticipate, particularly with spelling. Um, ages and birth dates may often vary by a few years. Don't discredit a person born within five years of the date you expect. Oftentimes, and especially up until really the 20th century, people didn't have documents notifying them of their birth. Sometimes their parents didn't even remember when they were born after so many years had passed. People sometimes didn't even have calendars in their walls. It's very common in history. The idea of record keeping and paper and timekeeping beyond what you were doing for the next 24 years is in the long arc of human history, a relatively recent development. So don't worry if the numbers are off a little, it could still be your person. Um, this is another thing to uh, understand in regards to those two things that might be different is the records you find in modern day have been through many hands and have been transcribed and retranscribed many times. And it's like a game of telephone that goes through decades and centuries. Um, to do a short example, um, perhaps in 1800, somebody did write down a birth certificate or people did live in an address. Then the census taker came and perhaps the census taker and the people living at the address didn't share the same language and had different levels of reading and writing. So they say their names to the census taker. He doesn't hear them right. He doesn't let them write it down in the book. So he just comes up with his own spelling. And the next thing you know, that goes into the larger federal logbook for the census. And the next thing you know, in the 1940s, somebody's typing up an index card to put in a larger collection and they get one or two letters wrong. And the next thing you know, somebody's entering those index cards into the Ancestry database today and they make a typo. There's going to be small errors throughout time. Just keep that in mind, be flexible, that's the key. Another important thing to realize is records do not always exist. Natural disasters, 
wars and historic misplacement can all lead to gaps in records. The uh, development of modern archival practice is a very recent thing. There are levels of security and organization that um, you know, state of the art archives try to engage in that didn't exist 30, 50, 80 years ago, and certainly not one or 200 years ago. Um, just to put it in perspective, we could do a little chain. Like, let's say the records office was founded in 1718, but then in 1820, there was a fire and a bunch of the records were lost. And then let's say in 1856, the junior clerk decided to bring what records remained home to enter them all into a log book, but then they died in their sleep. And then the people that went to clear out that junior record clerk's house saw those records from the archives, didn't know what they were, and just threw them out in the street. Things go missing. It happens. Um, then it's also important to address that people of color will face unique challenges in genealogical research due to factors such as slavery and other historic structural racism that affected both their access to and the quality of the records they were given. Discrimination influenced record keeping throughout history. It's, it is unfortunately a fact, but people have been working in groups and together in societies to try to figure out ways to continue the chain of tracing despite these inequities. And more modernly, the advent of genetic profiling, um, such as 23andMe, ancestry genealogy, et cetera, are allowing people to trace family trees even though they didn't, they were not given the same records that the dominant society was. So these are some more technical tri tricks. Um, databases, obviously, we're in the internet virtual age. You're going to be spending a lot of time on internet databases. In fact, we offer Ancestry and Heritage Quest to library card holders, and I believe we offer the same, um, the, the libraries offering the same services depending on where you're here from today include St. Tammany Parish Library, Jefferson Parish Library, East Baton Rouge Parish Library, New Orleans Public Library. Generally, if you're a card holder right now, you have access to Ancestry, Heritage Quest, Fold 3 newspapers through your library card. And if you're not local, check with your local public library. You may have access to these things as well. Um, even though uh, we do think of a, the libraries as just a place for books, they're often the places that will get you free access to these digital resources. But that being said, um, databases. Don't ever do a general search on the home page. Avoid filling out every box on a database search screen and learn the record collections offered by each database so you know where to start a search. Don't look necessarily for marriage certificates in Fold 3, the military database, and don't necessarily look for um, a soldier's memorial records in Ancestry because Fold 3 has more of a monopoly on that. Um, in terms of doing a general search on the homepage, on a, in a big old place like Ancestry, you're going to be searching tens of millions of records for John Smith. So you're going to get tens of millions of results. If you're, this, is, this ties back into keeping a clear goal in mind, but if you're going to be searching for a birth record for John Smith, make sure you go to the birth record collection in whichever database you're using. Um, avoid filling out every box on a database search screen. That ties back to the more things that you need to go right, the less results you'll get. As we talked about genealogy and names, it's a very, you need to be flexible in your searching. If you insist that a name be spelled a certain way and you end up with no results, you may be missing one of those little kind of errors. Like your guy may be there, you're just not going to get him because you insist it be spelled the way that you think it should be. This goes back to being flexible, but also the more search screen, the more boxes you fill out on a search screen, the more you're limiting yourself in the same way. Of course, um, read the collection information, as you can see circled over there. Um, you're not gonna find a birth certificate in the death index, and you're not gonna find a World War II draft card in the Civil War collection. Um, if you're having trouble and you've been limiting by a geography, 
try broadening your search. If you've drilled down to New Orleans, Louisiana, try expanding to Orleans Parish, then to Louisiana. You never know, somebody might have been in Jefferson Parish, and if you're limiting it to New Orleans, you're never going to get the record. And um, this goes back to if you're searching out of the area or out of the area you live in, get on the internet and look up the local libraries and genealogy societies in the place you're searching for. Um, I, when I was doing some genealogy, I reached out to Arkansas genealogical societies and Arkansas public libraries in the counties of interest to me to find out what they knew about the best way to research those records in that area. Of course, we get back to names and I wanted to give you some more concrete examples of name things you need to be flexible about in names. Um, of course, there's spelling. As you can see here, we have Christina in effectively three different ways. Um, married versus maiden. Um, if your mom was married to your dad and took his last name and her name was Marianne Smith, but you're looking for when she was a child and lived with her parents, you're not going to find her looking for Marianne Smith. You need to know her maiden name to find her as a child and thus perhaps find her parents in the census. Um, nicknames are a big thing. As we talked about, um, sometimes when people were speaking to the census taker, they didn't necessarily give their, their, uh, their uh, Christian name, their, their baptized name. They might have given their nickname, Joe, Tony, Ed, Sissy. Um, then if you're looking in newspaper articles, if you're researching newspaper articles, be very careful because it depends on how people decided to cite people's names. Like, did they just go Joe Benoit? Did they go Joseph Benoit? Did they go Joseph A. Benoit or Joseph Alcide Benoit? It's important to be open to those options, especially when you're searching a newspaper for quotes or stories. Um, this goes back to nicknames. We go to self-identified versus legally identified. What's your legal name? versus your, your, the name that you uh, generally are known by. And that, of course, is more of a 20th century development. Um, prior to certain points, what you said your name was could often be what your name was. Um, this is a very uh, technical trick, is uh, wildcards and truncation symbols for databases. You can use the asterisk, the star, to replace up to five characters in a word. So if you're looking for similar names, such as Johns, Johnson, Johnston, um, you could do the star to find all those results after J-O-H-N. Um, if you're looking for something where the vowel or an internal letter may, be, may often be changed, for example, when I'm doing my genealogy, often at some point we go from Fallis, F-A-L-L-I-S, to Fallis, F-O-L-L-I-S, you can use a question mark to replace that vowel. For example, if you search C-H question mark N, you will get results for Chan, Chen, and Chin. And this is going to bring my part of the presentation to a close, but you wanna learn about the institutions, such as churches, the archdiocese, et cetera, and government agencies in your area, and you wanna find out if they do carry the records you seek, and if so, do they make them available digitally? Do they make them available via mail? What's the process? It can be different for every locality. Um, you wanna learn how vital records birth, marriage, and death are kept in the state you're interested in. For example, for those of you in Louisiana, you may already be familiar that you can only obtain death and marriage records 50, 50 years after the event if you are not a direct blood relative. And uh, birth records you can only obtain 100 years after the birth if you are not a direct relative. Um, in Oklahoma, it's 125 years for all three, as I learned. And then in places like Texas, it's open records from the get-go. Um, you need to uh, learn how to Google and you need to learn how to Google intelligently. Um, if you Google genealogy and you click on a link and the website seems really intent on selling you something or selling vitamins, that's not a good website for you to go to. Go back to your results and look a little harder. In this case, try adding in a couple more search terms. 
Um, be sure to ask friends and other genealogists you know if a website that you have encountered seems legit or not. Or ask people like me at the archives. You can give us a call or email me, which we'll be giving our contact information at the end of the presentation, and ask me, hey, I found this website, this is what it's like, and I can, you know, perhaps, you know, give an opinion on whether it seems legit or not, because um, although uh, a, a master's in library and information science may sound like it's just books, it's also about information finding and determining valid information searches. So, so I did learn something in school, <laughs> and I can help you all with that if you have questions, if you just don't know. Um, for example, one of my favorite things, which you may have been to before, is US GenWeb. That is a large volunteer website that contains genealogical transcriptions from across the country. It's a great place to look. Of course, even with Ancestry um, in the user, the user section in the commons or um, with any volunteer website, um, it may not be accurate, but even if it's not correct, it can set you on the right path. It's like following clues in a case, you know, something like that. But um, so that sums it up for my intro to genealogy. Um, we are now going to turn it over to Kimberly Johnson to give her presentation on genealogy in the archdiocesan context, specifically for New Orleans. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kimberly Johnson, the Senior Processing Archivist at the um, Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans. I'm here to guide you through identifying your Catholic ancestors through our sacramental records. But first, let me give you a little background on the Archdiocese of New Orleans and the Archdiocesan Archives. The mission of the Office of Archives and Records uh, <clears throat> is to document and care for the historical records, publications, manuscript collections, and related records documenting the Catholic experience in Louisiana. Our records date from 1718 to present. <clears throat> Erected in 1793 and originally known as the Diocese of Louisiana and the Floridas, the, Archdi the Archdiocese of New Orleans was a joint creation of the King of Spain and the Pope. Having roots in the Catholic realm of France and Spain, the, Archdi um, the Archdiocese has a distinctive history unlike the diocese established in the English and Protestant traditions of the Eastern Seaboard. After the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, New Orleans became an American diocese, but the traditions and practices took more than a century to change. In the early history of Louisiana, Catholic Church cannot be separated from the early colonial period of Louisiana. As part of the colonial empires of France and Spain, the settlers of Louisiana were to be Catholic if they were to be faithful. <clears throat> Even the Code Noir, the French law that governed the treatment of the enslaved, mandated that the enslaved be instructed and baptized in the Catholic faith, freed from work on Sunday, and treated humanely. The Archdiocese of New Orleans encompasses 4,208 square miles, eight civil parishes, over 120 church parishes. It includes elementary and high schools, numerous health care centers, homes for the aged and handicapped, as well as organizations directed by Catholic charities. Among the most important Louisiana resources available to scholars are the extensive, well-maintained, and searchable sacramental registers, which record baptisms, confirmations, marriages, and burials of individuals. Because sacramental registers detail the life history of the local community over time, they have always been recognized by church officials as having unique and enduring value. More importantly, they illustrate the Catholic heritage of families that are passed from one generation to another. Scholars have used these sacramental records to study immigration patterns, community development, ethnic origins, social history, linguistic practices, family history, and cultural diversity. Researching the lives of the enslaved and free persons of color is possible using sacramental registers. Ming emissions, surnames, recognized paternity, and evidence of literacy are examples of the social evidence available within these records. Under Spanish law, the enslaved acquired freedom in a number of ways. 
<clears throat> the enslaved were freed through voluntary manumission of the slave owner. Also at his death, <clears throat> in his will, they were freed, freed through coratacion, the process of self-purchase, which was instituted by the Spanish. Slaves could also be freed by the enslaver at baptism. Such is the case with the baptism that we're viewing now. It's written in French and it says, in the year 1838, the 16th of May, I, the undersigned associate priest at the Church of St. Mary, have baptized Elizabeth, age of three years, daughter of Felice, slave woman, and father unknown. She has for a godfather, Forshi, and her godmother, Cora Forshi. The child was at her baptism declared free by Alexander Francois Forshi and Louise Patrell, her master and mistress who have signed the present act with me. <clears throat> there is always interest in Marie Laveau, so I thought it would be fascinating to share her marriage record. This record is in Spanish and references the marriage of Maria and Santiago in 1819. It's important to remember that names may vary due to language they were recorded in. Santiago might be recorded as Jacques or James, depending on the record keeper and the time period in which the record was recorded. Within someone's lifetime, their name can be recorded in various languages within our books. Hence, the certificates that we issue could contain different spellings of the same person's name. This is a funeral record from the St. Louis Cathedral that was recorded in French. The entry includes a date and cemetery of burial, time of death, age of death, where in France the deceased was originally from, name of spouse and her native parish, name of the deceased parents. Can you really ask for more from a funeral record? <clears throat> uh, Father Antonio de Sedella, also known as Pierre Antoine, recorded this record. He is known for his robust record keeping, writing historical notes within sacramental books, and his very neat and legible penmanship. Père Antoine lived much of his tenure in a small hut behind the cathedral, but he often clashed with authorities and was temporarily exiled to Spain in 1789. But that's a topic for another webinar. These are two burial records. The first is from St. Louis, number St. Louis Cemetery number three and is from 1905. It gives very minimal information. It gives the name of the deceased and tell us he was residing in Alexandria. It states that he did not die of a contagious disease and gives the date of death, but no location of his tomb. The second record is from St. Louis number one in 1902. It gives us the deceased age, sex, race, place of birth, cause of death, place of death, family tomb that she is buried in, and a loose location of the tomb. These two records highlight how differently records can be. Some records are a wealth of information, and some leave you wishing that there was more information. By this point, you may have noticed that there's a lot to be gleaned from our registers. Each sacramental record tells a story within itself. Are you wondering how to get to our records? Let's talk about our available services, including genealogical research, which consists of locating and translating sacramental records. We also handle dual citizenship research requests and notarization of certificates to be used for dual citizenship. As time permits, we will also do complementary cemetery research for cemetery pass purposes or to get a location of a grave. But be aware that the location information is not always included in the burial record. A month and a year of death is required, and a specific cemetery is appreciated when we do these complementary research for you with the cemetery records. Unfortunately, we are unable to do on-demand requests, so please do not call from the cemetery and ask us to look up a cemetery record right then. Please contact us a week before your cemetery visit so that we have time to look into your research request. Before contacting us about cemetery records, please visit the genealogy section of our website and reference the document titled, Whom to Call for Cemetery Records. If it's not a record we hold, it might be located on the New Orleans Catholic Cemetery's burial search on their website. Learn more about this in session four. 
We also offer historical research. Besides the 1,456 sacramental registers we hold, within the archives there are approximately 6,000 cubic feet of box archival material, which includes administrative files, property files, organizational files, parish visitation reports, institutional histories, and photograph collections. We also hold 528 bound volumes of primary source material as well as secondary sources numbering more than 3,500, including the official Catholic directory, archdiocesan newspapers, and parish histories. We have a research archivist on staff who can take research requests by mail. One of the first steps in starting research on sacramental books is figuring out if we hold the sacramental book for the time period and church you need. This is the top of a document available to genealogical researchers. It lists by civil parish what churches we hold books for. This document is a great resource for determining if we hold the record for the time period you're looking into. The churches are listed in alphabetical order and it gives a first and last recorded date of baptisms, marriages, funerals, and burials. There, are notable, there is a notable information section that contains facts such as church name changes, gaps in records, overlap years, records lost to fires, and other details. The gaps listed in this section are not all inclusive. Others may exist. This image shows the same document. This section contains a listing for the St. Louis Cathedral and the St. Louis cemeteries. These books contain gaps in the early records, which are listed in the notable information section. There are 109 locations, which include churches, chapels, a school, hospitals, and cemeteries. You can find this document on our website in the genealogy section, as well as on the library's program page. Unfortunately, there are some types of searches we are unable to fulfill. For instance, we cannot give you a list of everyone in a grave or all tombs associated with a specific surname. Historically, records were not created in a way that allow us to know everyone who's in a tomb. Burials were recorded in general according to the cemetery and date, often without an index. In some cases, the Office of Catholic Cemeteries can do some title searches. More information on title records will be presented in session five. Additionally, we cannot provide you with a family tree. You have to request each record separately, which will allow you to grow your family tree one record at a time. And really, isn't that the fun part of all this? Unfortunately, we are unable to honor one of our favorite requests, everything you can find on a person or family. While we all wish that there was a magic database all of our sacramental records fit into, that you can just type a name and the person pops up, uh, that just isn't the case. Each sacrament is held in separate books and the sacraments are often uh, happened at more than one church location. <clears throat> we are unable to look to see if a record is there before you send in the request form. The fee for genealogical research is for the research, but there is a way for you to do your own research in our sacramental books. We have digital scans and indices of our, on our website up to 1815. More on this in session four. To be fair to everyone who is requesting research, we limit researchers to four mail-in requests at one time. When you, when those requests are completed and they've been received by you, feel free to request four more. The researcher will note significant gaps in the early Catholic New Orleans records from colonial Louisiana. To give context into the gaps in the early books, I would like to share a short historic account. Two devastating fires destroyed many original Sacramento records from this period. When the fire of 1718 broke out in the French Quarter, Father Antonio de Sedella moved some of the sacramental records to the home of the director for tobacco. When the priest was notified that the Ursuline convent was threatened, he had the presence of mind to gather up the remaining registers and papers and throw them into the plaza facing the church, presently known as Jackson Square, before rushing to help the nuns. The director's house with the church records was quickly consumed by fire. The registers that remain today are those that were tossed into the square. 
A detailed list of these gaps are found in the introduction of the first four volumes of our published indices. This information has been added to the notable information section in the document I referenced earlier, books held by the Office of Archives and Records, which can be found on our website in the genealogy section as well as the library's programming page. There are also gaps of missing entries around wartime and when we were overwhelmed by an epidemic. Damage to the original books is also a reason some gaps exist. Here are some photographic examples of this damage. These are all St. Louis Cathedral registers from the early to mid 1700s. Iron gall ink has been used for the last several centuries and some formulations can be extremely corrosive to documents. The ink can render manuscripts and other documents illegible and inaccessible by causing loss of text, bleeding, fading, strike through, and acid migration. These books have been deacidified and encapsulated to stabilize and protect the documents, but the damage cannot be undone. This image shows extreme fading in a St. Louis Cemetery 1 and 2 death record register. This is an example of water damage in an internment book. Currently, these books are held in a fire safe vault located on a second floor. The vault is climate controlled and best practices are used when handling the books. The preservation of these registers limit their handling to staff members only. Certified certificates of original sacramental records can be obtained by mail from the Archdiocesan Archives. We'll discuss the ordering process in session two. Please be aware all records do not contain the same information. The typical sacramental format differed depending on time period, priest, and church. In general, French and Spanish priests were meticulous record keepers, but when the Irish arrived, the records they produced contained less information. The record pictured on the left is from St. John the Baptist Edgard, enslaved and free people of color baptism register. The page contains baptisms of the enslaved. It gives minimal information about the people being baptized. The record on the right is a baptism from St. Patrick in New Orleans. While it does give the name of the parents, the record includes minimal information. Some baptism entries have additional information such as place of birth and date of birth. And now we will hear from Heather from the New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. Hello everyone, um, I'm Heather Veneziano, Director of Public Engagement and Development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. And you'll be hearing more from me during future sessions, but for this one, I just wanted to mention a few things. Uh, New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries was established in 1966 by Archbishop Hannon. Prior to that date, cemeteries were operated by individual parishes. We currently own and operate a total of 13 cemeteries on over 107 acres of sacred ground. 12 of the cemeteries are located within the city of New Orleans and one is in Luling within St. Charles Parish. St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 was founded in 1789 and is the oldest extant cemetery in the city. Sessions four through six and especially sessions five and six will focus more on cemetery records and research. Okay, um, I want to thank you all, uh, Heather and uh, Kimberly, for this excellent presentation. Um, I think this is incredible information, and we're so glad that you all were able to put together this wonderful presentation and, uh, and to uh, give it today. Um, that being said, uh, we are momentarily going to start our questioning section. I will be sure to let you know exactly when it starts, but before that happens, I want to go over a couple of guidelines. Um, for the ch Once the chat is available, that's how you will be able to ask questions. Um, I want to stress that only submit questions via chat. Please keep it clear of conversations or crosstalk. Please submit only one question per participant Make sure your question pertains to the information presented today. 
If your question is deemed to address something that will be coming up in the future five sessions, please make note of it and reserve it for one of those sessions. If you are unable to attend one of those sessions, please be sure to view the video once it is posted and then use our contact information to email us or call us. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible by 1215 today. And don't worry if we don't get to yours, we will be posting our contact information so you can email or call us. Um, again, please feel free to contact any of us if we don't get to your question today. Um, that being said, remember these guidelines. I've put up this, um, I'm going to put this right back up in just a second but I want to um, check one thing. I need to be able to uh, stop the screen sharing for a second and allow chat to happen. Just one moment, y'all. Okay. Chat. So chat should now be enabled. Um, you are now welcome to start sending your questions. Um, I will leave this up, um, this contact information up while we uh, present questions. And uh, depending on the nature of the question, um, let's see here, uh, either Kimberly, Heather, or myself will answer it. Um, please, if you can, continue to uh, use the chat section. It is now open and you are welcome to start typing in your questions. I will be able to read them to the presenters. Okay, and we have our first question um, from Gail Garcia. Are records of Catholic nuns in the books when they die, et cetera? Um, okay, so if they were buried in a specific cemetery, then in general, the record of the burial should be in there. I mean, there's always a possibility that there's a gap during that time period or that the record for that time period was damaged in some way. But in general, anybody that's buried in a, a cemetery or alternatively, anybody that is having a funeral, they would in general be in the, the book, but there's always exceptions. Okay, thank you. Our next question um, is, do we need to register again for the second session or will we automatically receive another email? You will not need to re-register, but I do not believe you'll receive another email. So please uh, retain the one that you use to connect today and use it to connect again. Um, our next question is from Lisa Gonzalez. Uh, she says, thank you all. Um, are there plans to digitize these records in the future in order to allow online search? And I know some of this will be addressed in future sessions, but the short answer is? Um, I mean, we have more records digitized, but right now we only have up to 1815 up as far as like, will we uh, eventually put more um, records past 1815 up? I mean, that's the hope, but we just, this is only just one small portion of the work that we do. And so sometimes like making sure that records that are more current are digitized or that we're processing things that are coming in has to kind of take precedent over things. So I guess the answer is like, eventually that would be the hope. Okay, and let's see here. Um, next we have, uh, are there any holdings or collections of oral histories? Um, that's really a question for the research archivist. You can use the email and the contact us and you could email her about, you know, what kind of oral histories would be available. Okay, this is a question for the second session, but um, I, I do think that there is a short answer for this one. How do you get a photocopy of actual record rather than just a certificate? That's not a thing, is it? So it really depends, like it is possible for an additional fee to get not a, a photocopy, but like an image that would be certified, but it totally depends on the state of the record, if it can be safely photographed, if it's encapsulated, sometimes it's hard to get a good photograph. Um, so the answer is possibly just depending on th the record and its, its state and if it's photographable. 
I mean, also a lot of times, sometimes because of the bleed through with the iron gall ink, like it's really hard for people to make out what it says. I mean, we would, if you had requested an image, we would give it to you, but know that part of what we do is, you know, translate it, but then also try to decipher what it says when there is issues with the ink. Um, our next question, which um, thank you for asking, sir. Um, are you able to access New Orleans library information with a Jefferson Parish library card? Um, yes, yes you are. What you will need to do at this time is just make an appointment with your local Jefferson Parish library, or I'm, I'm sorry, make an appointment with one of the New Orleans library branches, whichever one's closest to you, and uh, tell them that you want to sign up for a reciprocal card. And they will get you the New Orleans library number, which depending on the database you're entering, will get you access to our records versus theirs. I do wanna stress that most of the records that um, the city archives holds is actually on our website, archives.nolalibrary.org, and that doesn't require any sort of card sign in at all to use. Um, the next question is, can you use more than one question mark in a search, i.e. B question mark LL question mark GER? It depends on the database and if it's set up for that level of complexity. You will have to try depending on which database you're in. Um, the next question, do residents of East Baton Rouge Parish have access to New Orleans Digital Library through EBRPL membership? Um, so, uh, a lot of the databases that we share um, are generally like the newspapers, Ancestry, Heritage Quest. Um, you would not need a New Orleans uh, library card to access the same offerings as you get through your East Baton Rouge Parish card. So um, we don't offer reciprocal borrowing, but no worries, you wouldn't need it anyway. You should have access to the same databases through your East Baton Rouge Parish card as you would have gotten through a New Orleans Parish card. In fact, you may have some more offerings. Um, again, I wanna say everything city archives wise on archives.nolalibrary.org does not require a card from anybody to access. Next, what Louisiana parishes are covered by the Archdiocese of New Orleans? Um, okay, it's Orleans, Ascension, Jefferson, Plaquemines, St. Bernard, St. Charles, St. John the Baptist, St. Tammany, and Washington. And um, if that was too quick for you, feel free to email any of the three of us. We can get you that answer. It's actually, you can access that document on the library's website that I had showed. <laughs> Just right here on this column is the list of all the different parishes, so you could access that if you'd like. And I'm pretty sure it's also on our homepage. Okay, um, so um, I am looking for an ancestor who died in St. Charles Parish in 1848. Am I able to contact you? Okay, uh, unfortunately for you, um, the St. Charles records that, the, there's only two churches in St. Charles that we hold books for. The first one is Our Lady of the Holy Rosary in Hanville, and they don't have any records until 1877. The second one is St. Charles Borromeo in Destrehand, and it's also known as the the Red Church, there was a fire that burned all of their records from 1756 to seven, uh, I'm sorry, to 1895. And so if, if there, so unfortunately there just isn't any records for that time period. Um, yeah, sorry. Oh. Okay, um, uh, next question is, can you use the asterisk in the middle of the name? No, um, that's what the question mark is for. So uh, instead of an asterisk, if you're searching for a spot in the middle of a name, do the question mark. Now, unfortunately, I think what you're getting at is will the question mark cover more than one character? Again, it depends on the database. You'll have to try with each database to see if it will take more than one question mark, but generally in my experience, I've never seen one. Um, the next question, um, this will actually be covered more in a, in a future session, but is it possible to request a copy of a title of a tomb where your ancestor is buried? Uh, we do make some, under certain circumstances, we do make title copies available. Um, 
I'm going to cover that more in another session, but you're also, if you have a direct question about that, you're, you can get in touch with our title clerk at our main office and the phone number, which is on our information provided, but it's also 504-596-3050. But we'll go into that more um, in a future session. Okay. Um, and it's 596-3050? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says 4963050 on this slide. Oh, it maybe is. I'm okay, sorry. Yeah, just, just <laughs> Whatever it says on there, let's go with that. That's just I can no, double check. 496 but. doesn't work. Everybody use 596 for uh, New Orleans Catholic cemeteries. Um, let's see here. Um, it's 596. I just checked. Um, so this is not related to our presentation because we are focusing on the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Um, where to find information on Catholic orphanages in Baton Rouge from 1870s to 1890s. Unfortunately, um, do, do you all know anything the, about this? You need to contact the Diocese of Baton Rouge, like they have their own records. Right, you will need to contact the Diocese of Baton Rouge, which um, I believe their website is diobr.org. Um, and they do have an archives. Mm -hmm. um, okay, next. Um, do records exist of girls who are housed by the nuns at the Ursuline convent having arrived as casket girls? Um, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see that question here. Um, so we do have information about the, um, we do have books from the Ursuline convent and some records having to do with like schooling that was going on there, but I, I think that there's some like misinformation out there about the casket girls and their association with the Ursuline, but uh, Ursuline nuns. So I think you would just need to write into the research archivist so she could provide you with that information. Um, so the next question does not pertain to what we're focusing on in this six week series or this presentation, but what are some tips about accessing property records for past family homes and businesses in Louisiana? That is something, that is a question that you will want to ask the City Archives and Special Collections at New Orleans Public Library. I do recommend emailing your question to that contact info, which is on the screen now. That's archivist at nolalibrary.org, or you can call us during normal business hours, which are generally 10 to 5, Monday through Friday at 596-2610. Um, from, we have, did the geography of the Archdiocese change over time? Uh, yeah, originally we were the Diocese of Louisiana and the Floridas, like it was a huge um, area. I, it's hard to know exactly what you're trying to get at with like just this question, but I mean at one time also we had all of Louisiana, but as there's been uh, additional dioceses created, those records have been like parsed out to them that pertain to their diocese. So if, if you're looking for information on something that happened in another part of Louisiana, then you would have to contact the diocese that that goes with. We only hold records for the eight civil parishes that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, next question. Are enslaved or persons without a surname information included in the published books for the archdiocese? Um, will that information be digitized? Um, okay, so I believe that in the, we call them the gray books, in the, in the indices, there's a section that talks about why they didn't include those because of how it would have been hard to, I guess, like, collate them or to use them in the book in a way that was, like, meaningful because there was no last name to go by, and it kind of explains that. Um, and as far as will that information be digitized, um, what, what information exactly, like, slave or Three persons of color with that doesn't include their surname. Oh, I mean, yeah, I think yes. that's what they so mean. So in any of the books that are up to 1815, they're all digitized. So I mean, if it is no surname or surname, they're still available. So I know in like St. John the Baptist Edgar, there's definitely um, enslaved and free person of color books that they do not include surnames and those are still digitized and available on our website up to 1815. Okay. Um, and again, if, if there's more uh, details or stuff that you want to know, please feel free to email us at any of the email addresses posted on the screen right now. Um, 
is there someone available to interpret a will written in French? Um, I will say that that is, that's not what we do. We aren't professional interpreters. Um, and if it's not a record, I, I'm assuming, please tell me if I'm wrong. If it's not a record in your purview, you will not be translating it. Um, and don't offer that service. But you can Google professional local translators. And um, the uh, if you Google uh, Orleans civil clerk um, uh, uh, researchers, I believe they have, I'm not sure if it's current, a list of people that you may be able to contact to hire for that purpose. Um, next question is, when will this recording and handout be posted? Um, the, the slides and um, an updated handout will be available this Monday and the recording will be posted um, no later than Tuesday on YouTube, which the link again will be on that page um, at archives.nolalibrary.org where you click on the link to the program. Uh, next question, would public libraries have access to Ancestry.com without the freeze? Yes, that is the point of a public library is you can get access to awesome stuff like Ancestry.com without paying money. And we do offer the full service. Depending on your locality, please contact your local public library to make sure they have the subscription. I know that those of us that do, such as East Baton Rouge, um, Jefferson, St. Tammany, and Orleans, we, um, Ancestry is currently um, so generally what the situation is, is you used to have to come into the libraries to use it um, for free, but um, at least they're extending it on a month by month basis, at least through the end of September, Ancestry is offering it at home to the library card users as well through the databases. Um, if, if and when Ancestry does um, make it to where you have to come to the library again, most of us also have Ancestry Light, which is known as Heritage Quest, and you can always use that at home. Okay, next question. How can I get access if I am no longer a U Louisiana resident? We live in Utah now. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's access to the Archdiocese and records, you would follow the instructions that we'll be presenting in session two about how to mail in requests, or how to view um, documents online. If you're referring to the databases such as Ancestry, the newspapers, et cetera, um, your local library in Utah almost certainly um, has a free Ancestry subscription because that is the home of Ancestry. Please check with your local library, your local public library in Utah to see what they offer by way of genealogy databases, um, and uh, uh, any sort of other um, online databases through your library card. Um, let's see here. Can you obtain a New Orleans library card as an out-of-state resident? Um, and will the slides be available? Yes, the slides will be available Monday. Um, uh, you can obtain a New Orleans library card as an out-of-state resident, um, I believe. Um, right now, due to the current situation, there is uh, some, some uh, flexibility to the terms. Please, if you would, go to nolalibrary.org and um, check out our uh, sign up for a library card section for the out of area um, thing. And, and, and if it's not very clear, please just uh, email ask a librarian and they'll get you set up. Next, um, do you hold the records for the Corpus Christi School for the 1920s? Is that something we looked in the books for? Um, I, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't have anything in front of me to search by that. But let me just say that um, school records in general um, are never open for genealogical purposes. That a school record is only open to the person whose record it is. And after that person dies, no one has access to any school records. So, but as far as like maybe a picture of the school or just other general information about the school, that might, that would be available through the research archivist, but not a student record. I would say, please just email them for clarification, but th it, that's essentially, yeah. Um, and we do have a clarification. It is 596 yes. and thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> um, would church records include St. Charles Parish at the time it was known as German Coast? And that is a yes, right? So, it, I mean, we are, our St. Charles records go back to 1793, I'm sorry, 1739, but don't forget that we have that like 150 year gap. So it's possible that if it's a record during that time period that there isn't any 
record, it, from at least the Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, next question. Will additional volumes of sacramental records be published? No. No. Yeah, I, I was under the impression that that was not going to be the case. Um, it, the, the quick explanation, please correct me if I'm wrong, is just literal human beings have exploded exponentially and so have the records. There's only so much that can literally be done to make the books. The, the reason the first set of gray books was able to be made is because there were so many fewer people in the records at the time. Right. It's something that humans could still achieve. Um, now there's so many of us, it's, it's hard. Um, I think mean, that's definitely part of it, and I just think that also, um, you know, all that, like, takes a lot of time and money. We have a small staff, and so, I mean, we have to focus on a lot of things for people that are, like, still living, you know? I mean, and I know that it's uh, important to a lot of people, genealogy in general, but, I mean, we do have services that still allow you to get those records. Unfortunately, there just isn't going to be any more indices that I know of. Okay, um, our next question is, what is the best way to add an ancestor's nickname? I've been using the quotation marks, but not sure if that is the best method. I would say, given the flexibility of, of uh, nicknames, you would not want to use quotation marks at all, because what quotation marks mean is find this exactly. Mm -hmm. And because mm -hmm. nicknames are so flexible, I would recommend not using quote, quotation marks around them at all. Um, the next question, if you're born in New Orleans and no longer live there, can you get a New Orleans library card? Yes, please check our website. Um, as I mentioned before, um, there's some uh, malleability to the terms. Um, in the past, what it is, is you pay $50 a year for a non-resident card, but that gets you access to hundreds of dollars of databases for free. Uh, well, for $50 um, a year, uh, as opposed to, you know, $100 a month. Um, but uh, like I said, please vi visit nolalibrary.org and the get a card portion. And um, please give them a call or, or send a question in to ask a librarian and they should be able to clarify for you. Oh, I can help in French. Can I obtain a New Orleans library card from France? Um, let's see here. Um, like same situation, um, Miss or Mr. Sylvain. Um, Yes, uh, please go to nolalibrary.org um, and uh, check into getting an out of area library card. Um, I will say, uh, in the meantime, um, if you go into the library catalog and you can sign up everybody for a temporary account that will give you a specialized card number that will allow you access to the databases, no problem. Um, I'm not sure, I believe the timeline on that is two months at this juncture. So, um, you know, if you do want uh, two months of access, well, number one, please, please contact the, the circulation people through the library website directly, which, like I said, is nolalibrary.org, and you want to go to card services or ask a librarian. But um, if you enter the library catalog, um, please, uh, you know, if you go to uh, sign up, you can get a temporary card number that will give you access to the databases um, uh, until uh, that time. Um, we are uh, coming up upon 1215. I know we have a lot more messages that we haven't gotten to and I do want to apologize in, um, in advance of that. I know there's a lot of you that I have not gotten to. So please, please, please use the information on this slide that is up right now to email us or call us during our business hours and uh, see if um, you know we can get you the right answers. Um, but I will go ahead and uh, ask, uh, is, is six more questions all right? It is with me. Yep, it's yeah. fine. Okie doke. Um, the next question is, where would I find information about orphanages in the Irish Channel in the 1910 to 1920 time? Um, orphanages are difficult in New Orleans um, for the express reason is I understand it that um, they generally, the records were not necessarily ending up with the archdiocese. We do have some orphanages that were run by the Catholic Church or by you know, different like 
brothers or sisters. And so it really, really just depends. You would need to email us so that we could just look into like what we have for those exact years and tell and you what- And it's also going to be subject to privacy requirements and statutes. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, of course, that would be for Catholic, um, um, uh, other, other denominations, other um, Christian denominations or other- um, City or orphanages secular orphanages um that would be different but i will say in general records are spotty and hard to find it just depends um please email one of us let's see here and let's see uh oh uh somebody um has generously supplied the information for those asking about saint charles parish records the library on highway 90 in luling has a room with winnie books and records for saint charles and other bayou parishes so please take advantage of that y'all um let's see uh, does the diocese have records for north louisiana before louisiana was a state north louisiana um uh, so if there's any records to that effect, then they would be within the diocese that, um, that that's in their area. So if you give us a call or an email, we can look at our list and tell you like what diocese would hold those records, but, but we don't hold them. Right, right. That's, um, that's general, is that Alexandria up north? Generally? I, or maybe Shreveport? I mean, I really no, have yeah, Shreveport, yeah, Shreveport, yeah. I don't, I didn't want to say because I'm not 100% sure. Right, exactly. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's a thing to understand is is every archdiocese or diocese is generally an organizational unit unto itself and it may have different levels of access different organizational procedure etc but like she said you can call them and she can direct you to the correct diocese to ask about it um ancestry records are not available to request through interlibrary loan um because they they are they are available through ancestry um I, so generally you would need to have a library card that would get you access or a subscription um also ancestry records come from so many tens of thousands of different sources it would be a different situation for each one um thank you for the presentation and thank you for the compliment um let's see how can you log into heritage quest from home uh with your library card please go to your uh respective libraries uh database page on their website and then you will use your library card to log in and it will be one of the available databases this is if you're in operation of one of the four southeast louisiana parishes that i've been mentioning which at this juncture is East Baton Rouge Parish, St. Tammany Parish, Jefferson Parish, and Orleans Parish. But you will need to go to their databases portal through their main library website, and then it will ask you for your library card number. Um, do you have Catholic school yearbooks? Um, we have a few. It really just depends on the school, and it really comes down to if the school provided those um, to us or if they were a donation of gift from a student. I, I wouldn't say that we have many but we do have some you could just email into the um our email and the research archivist can give it a look okay oh i'm sorry there was a clarification for the ancestry record one she meant genealogy records um generally uh it's uh generally in my experience it airs on the side of no if they're available online they will not be offered through well the original records for sure will not be because they are archival records those will never be interlibrary loans generally um if it's on microfilm it depends on the institution i as microfilm becomes uh less and less common uh the, the direction starts looking more and more towards no. I know for, unfortunately, um, the City Archives do, does not interlibrary loan more than, I think, five rolls out of like 50,000 due to the fact that it's just too expensive and too hard to replicate them. Um, uh, and that being said, uh, I, unfortunately, I know we have about 40 other questions that I could not get to. And I do want to thank you all for like being so engaged and so wonderful. But um, could we, uh, um, if, if possible, um, please, please email us, please email us, please call us during the week, during business hours. Um, and uh, we will try to get to your questions. 
Um, of course, uh, our next session, uh, important to note, will be next Saturday, September 19th, uh, same, same bat time, 11 a.m., same bat channel. Uh, as we addressed before, you should be able to access it. If you registered today, you should be able to access all the next six sessions through that same email that you got today, okay? Um, so I want to thank you again, Kimberly and Heather. This was exciting. Um, I'm really looking forward to the requesting genealogy record session next week because I think it will add a lot of clarity, um, a lot of great stuff for all of us, and uh, it'll add a lot of clarity to what we can look for. And um, let's see. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, considering this is your first Zoom webinar, I am with, with the public. I am so glad that you decided to do it in collaboration with us. Um, this was great. And uh, thank you to all our patrons and thank you to everybody who attended today. Again, please feel free to share. We will be posting more updates um, for the upcoming sessions on, on social media. Um, of course, call, email, etc. anything you need to in the meantime. And again, thank you. Um, Y'all, uh, anything else to add? Thanks for hosting us, Amanda. We really appreciate the public library like handling all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. much. We love you too. And <laughs> thank you everybody. So yes, I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody's questions, but again, this information, I'm gonna leave it up for about one more minute and then I'm going to cut the feed, y'all, okay? Okay, thank you guys.